Okay, here we are, Math 1101. We'll be looking at Section 6.4 today. Uh, this is for the lecture of March 22nd and 23rd. And we'll be back live, of course, the 24th and 25th. We still have more to cover in Chapter 6, even though this looks like it's the end of the slides. Um, there's quite a bit more in the book than the slides have to offer, so I intend to cover it, including thorough coverage of the chapter quiz at the end and other problems as time allows and some Excel that may be of some use to you, although I don't think it's quite as useful as Chapter 4. These formulas are generally much easier. And we have the table, of course, for you, the Z table, as necessary. Um, thought I'd review a little bit about the two formulas we saw at the end of 6.3 last time, just to show you how the general trends can go. And uh, this margin of error, the whole idea is to make N large and the margin of error small. The smaller the margin of error, the more precise your poll or other type of estimate would be. And so polling is just one major use of this. There are others, of course. So, um, you know, if it's something on the job where you need to have an answer, but also a workable interval that's plausible around that estimate is the idea of a confidence interval, actually. And the margin of error is a big, big part of it. It's amazing my other book <laughs> tries to ignore margin of error at first. It's a very strange book. <laughs> but we don't have that book. I'm glad we got this book instead. Uh, overall, it's a much better book. But anyway, let's take a look at some examples here. And uh, what if we had uh, something really small? We didn't really look at something like this. What if n is only 50? Say you have, you're on a budget or something like that. Let me get this to work here. If n is only 50, I can get the pen to work. Then we would have the margin of error, which I will call m. <laughs> Little m, capital M, doesn't much matter. Uh, then you'll have it equal to 100 over the square root of 50. Now, the square root of 50 is just a little bit more than 7. I've already run the numbers on this. When you divide 100 by that, you do get a margin of error, unacceptable margin of error, I might add, of 14.2%. That's on either side of the estimate. So it could be like 50% plus or minus 14%. Nobody would buy that. So when it comes to these types of estimates, 50 is not even close to enough. <laughs> now, we looked at 500 already and even 683. And I'll just put down the result of 500 for now. M, this is an M, not an N. <laughs> that would equal about 4.5%. And rounding to the nearest tenth of a percent is plenty. We'll take more, I guess, if you have to, but a tenth is fine. A whole number not generally too good, though. Anyway, let's look at something else. What if we've already seen a big improvement, 14% versus 4%, uh, 4.5%. Yeah, that's already a big improvement. Of course, we had to get 10 times as many people for only a 10% change. What about if n equals 1,000? Seems like that would be a better deal anyway. And I'm going to let it be a small n, not a capital N, just to be a little bit more uh, you know, accurate about it. So if that's the case, then you have m equals 100 over, and I'm writing at an angle, so my handwriting isn't the best, Divide that by square root of 1,000, which is around 31.6. And when you divide that out, then your margin of error, you might have thought, oh, it'll be down to 2 or 1%. No, not quite. 3.2%. Well, it's an improvement. Maybe disappointing. <laughs> but it becomes slow going at the end. It's uh, exponential in a way. Uh, let's take a look at another one. What if we tried 10,000? <laughs> now, this would be a very large sample, something that you're not... Well, not likely to see, but it could happen. Then m would equal 100 over the square root of 10,000. You can try that on your calculator. That will be uh, exactly 1%. Now, that's a very good margin of error. That's exceptional, actually, but you have to get 10,000 people or 10,000 subjects to respond. And I may have looked at this in some of the other classes. Of course, I do four different lectures with slightly different twists and turns to them. But if you put in the whopping 100,000 like we saw in that one case earlier, with the allergies being 20% versus 21%, and that 1% difference was a big difference, if you remember. And so here, M, without showing all the, the machinations there, it works out to be 0.3%. Some of you already saw this one. Uh, and so that 1% versus a margin error of only 0.3%, that was triple that number. And so that, that showed how significant that really was, leading to a, 
much stronger z-score than we usually see. Z of 7.7. <laughs> That's not going to happen. That, that was extremely rare for that particular case. But here, shifting gears just a little bit, the margin of error is only 0.3% because we've got so much in our end. It's a big, big end. And that's good news, but it's also not going to happen much. <laughs> you have to have an unlimited budget and vast amounts of time. It's been known to happen, but not every day. <laughs> not at all. Okay, I wanted to turn to the other formula and show a few calculations there. And I, it was, uh, you know, random between the classes before, so I'm going to kind of cut across the board and just give you a progressive look at things. Um, for 95% level of confidence, which is the typical one, nothing special about that. This is just the typical one. It's the only one I would ever give you. I'm pretty sure WebAssign will respect that as well because uh, there are actually different formulas if you change the level of confidence. And we used to have a homework tool that would change that, but I hope I've gotten that standardized now. But if, if not, please let me know. Um, sometimes they do randomize the problems. I don't get to see all of them, and most of them are fine. Occasionally they may slip out of bounds a little bit, so just let me know if you see something on your web, web assign that looks a little strange. And the only one I will give you is 95. They briefly looked at a 90, but it turned out that didn't really matter to the problem, but that was just a different kind of problem. Looking for the sample size, which is called N. <laughs> I'll make it a small little N there. And it's needed to get a margin of error of M percentage points. Remember, this is in percentage. It can be approximated using the following formula. So what if we settle for a um, margin of error of 6? Not very good, but maybe we just don't have much of a budget. And certainly, I've seen polls that have a 6% margin of error. It's not considered great. But then you would have N equals 100 over 6 which is about 16.7, and you square that out, and n equals 278. Even that's a pretty large sample compared to some that I've seen, and 278, that's lower than we've seen in this book, though. We can take a look at m equals 5. I know I did that in some of the classes. Let's take a look at that. Now, to get a better margin of error, which I will say in my own words, better, it's more accurate, it's not wonderful. It's sort of typical, but then we would have n equals, this one actually cancels out pretty well. 100 and over 5 squared is 20 squared, which is easy. It's 400. So we have to get an extra, what, 122 people to get to 400, which gives us one extra uh, percentage point, uh, well, actually one less percentage point on the margin of error, which is a good thing. <laughs> So you have to add 122 people. Not that that really matters. It's supposed to be a plus sign, by the way. Let's take a look at, well, actually, we already saw this one. It's in the example, so I don't have to work it out for you. But m equals 4 led to n equals 625. One I'm pretty sure I didn't do is m equals 3. So n would equal 100 thirds completely squared. That's, what, 33 squared. And incidentally, you do round up, but that's something we don't have to worry about in this class. But it does trip up a lot of people in other classes. We'll only give you examples where it's a whole number, so you will not have to worry about the decimal. By the way, if anybody's ever heard of this, so you do actually have to round up because if a minimum is like a, it works out to actually be on your calculator, 1111.1. But that's the minimum number. And then 11.11 is below that minimum number, so it really goes to special roundup rule. Luckily, we will not have to worry about that unless you happen to be working some of the more advanced homework problems. But I don't think since they ever even brought it up in the book that they're going to pretty much avoid that kind of thing. Um, I know I will on the test. That's all you have to worry, worry about. What if we only want a 2% margin of error? This is just outstanding. I'll put a big star on that. But then you pay the price with a heavy N. 100 over 2 squared, that's 50 squared. And that happens to be 2,500. So to get that extra percentage point of accuracy, you had to more than double the sample size. <laughs> wow, good luck with that one. Now, what if you really want to go for the gusto, as they used to say? <laughs> and if you only want a 1% margin of error, then you're looking at really 100 squared. Dividing by 1 really doesn't matter. It's supposed to be a 100 there. And that's a whopping 10,000. Let's get that one extra percentage point. You had to get four times as much as before. And m equals zero is not going to happen. 
This is a bit ridiculous, but if I put that down, ha ha, n would actually become infinity. So we're not going to worry about that. But that's my point. You can't really get a perfect margin of error from these polls until you get a census, and that just isn't in the cards right at the moment. Okay, let's take a look at some other stuff, and I think we're ready to enter into the relatively short 6.4, but there's some interesting ideas here, so we need to talk about them. And we'll talk about it some more as we review the entire chapter uh, coming up in the next live lecture. And the results of a clinical trial are considered to be statistically significant if they're unlikely to have occurred by chance alone. So I have to push the button here. And chance alone. Okay, so yeah, the odds are way against it. So they'll say, oh, I just saw it on, on TV. The odds of picking a perfect bracket for the March Madness with the what, 68 teams in, in, the, in the tournament. It was like one in nine quintillion. <laughs> and we had some big numbers. But that's actually nine times 10 to the 18th power. I think we stopped a trillion. <laughs> so you got quadrillion and quintillion. That's like a million trillion. Hey, in other words, forget about it. Never going to happen. But somebody wins these competitions, and I don't know how many they get right out of the 67 or 68, but I'm sure it's a pretty big number, say 50 or something like that, maybe even 60. But to get them all right, that's just impossible, <laughs> practically. We have this thing called the p-value. It measures the property, the probability, sorry, that the outcome of a clinical trial would occur by chance alone if the treatment had no effect. So I call this a level of rarity, to kind of cut through the uh, words. It's a rarity level. Probably should have used the text for this, but now I'm on the iPad. Um, how rare is it? And there's a very small number shows that this is very rare, not likely to happen on its own. So I'll just give you, well, we have one right here. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just do it right now. Example, p-value as computed by technology most of the time, although there is a way to do it by hand. We're not going to do that. Uh, say it equals, oh, I don't know, 0 0.2, 0 0.02 rather, 2% chance of happening by itself. That's considered kind of rare. It'll happen on its own 2% of the time. And down here, we see the criteria that's mostly used is a 0.05 level. If it's less than that, that's considered statistically significant. We have a rare situation that's not likely to happen on its own. I mean, it could, but we're not going to bet on it. Let's put it that way. Yeah, some people gamble on crazy things, I guess. It's all part of life, I suppose. But anyway, uh, if we want to stay in the standard mode, 5% is the level. Now, another example might be p-value is 40%, 0 0.40. Now, that could happen on its own 40% of the time. That's not rare at all. Not rare. And another word to say, uh, to use here, is common. This is commonplace. Not very likely to be a, a problem at all, or even higher. Sometimes you get into paradoxical situations. The p-value is 99%. <laughs> Thankfully, we're not going to see any of that, because that goes so far the other direction that people get confused. It's like, what? And your estimate's sitting right on top of the mean, <laughs> which I've seen a few times. Well, we don't need to go into details on that. But rare means statistically significant, and that means that it's unlikely to have occurred by chance alone. But here, it is likely to have happened on its own. And nothing, nothing happening here. It's just commonplace stuff. So a small p-value, as they say, is usually interpreted as evidence that the, evidence, that the event in question is unlikely to be due to chance alone. Statistically significant, and the results are usually accepted as that way. If the p-value is five percent or smaller, we call it 0.05 for the for the calculator. Although they can bounce between the two, so you should be able to do that, of course. Um, for each of these situations in this example, we don't have to put p-values on them. We can just ask intuitively: Are these statistically significant or earth-shattering events? <laughs> Okay, here's one. You flip a coin 40 times and get heads each time. Good luck with that one. <laughs> I'm not saying it can't happen, because statisticians just about never say that. But uh, looking at the answer, number one, by something we may have seen before, uh, probably getting 40 heads in a row by flipping a fair coin is 1 over 2 to the 40th power. 
That is very, very rare. I had that calculated. I don't have the notes in front of me. It's something like 10 to the minus 15th or something like that. It's very, very small, very close to zero percent chance. And so it's very, very unlikely to have occurred by chance alone. And this result would be significant. So first thing that most people call into question is, what's wrong with that coin? <laughs> is it one of those coins you get in a magic shop that's got two heads on it? Or does it have a piece of gum on one side? Or <laughs> what's wrong with this coin? Or uh, somebody learned how to flip a coin in such a way that it lands a certain way every time. Well, yeah, um, that, that just isn't going to happen. However, you do hear, and it's in statistical textbooks sometimes, about what happened in Monte Carlo over a century ago where they got the same number on a roulette wheel, I don't know, something like 10, 15 times in a row. There's 38 numbers on a roulette wheel. <laughs> so that was an extremely rare event, somewhere in the billionths or trillionths. But it actually happened, and it was all verified. They, they checked the, the, the machine, the, the, the wheel, and made sure it was all accurate, and they simulated a few more times and got just random numbers. And Yeah, so rare things can happen. But when you get out to, you know, negative 15th power, that, that's getting pretty, pretty rare. Now, the second one, though, you're driving and you're passed by two pickup trucks in a row. Now, this may depend on where you're driving. If you're, you know, driving in Montana or something like that, then probably a little bit more likely than if you're in downtown L.A. or something like that. But, um, but pickup trucks are common enough, and so being passed by two in a row does not seem terribly unlikely. I mean, it might be the most common thing in the world, but for it to happen is not a big deal, usually. And this result does not seem statistically significant. This is just commonplace, in other words. So there's a difference between something that's rare, or maybe even too rare to be believable, or uh, commonplace. We don't make as big a deal about those, but it's nice to see both ends of the situation, for sure. So take a sip of coffee here, excuse me. The drug Vioxx was once used to treat arthritis. Not anymore. <laughs> One published study compared the incidence of heart disease in patients treated with Vioxx to patients treated with Aleve, common drug. Now, there's more to say here in the book. The book has a longer explanation of this example, so this is appealing to you. I encourage you to read the full example in the book. But this study they had showed a much greater incidence of heart disease, Vioxx patients, and for it to happen on its own <laughs> was quite rare. So that pretty much seals the deal that, yes, you do have a greater incidence of heart disease with a Vioxx. So the thing is, yeah, your arthritis might go away, but, oh, we'll trade that for heart disease. Not such a fair trade. Even if you have severe arthritis, nobody wants heart disease. So this is not a good trade, so to speak. Aleve, although personally Aleve didn't work for me when I had a toothache once, <laughs> took it all weekend long, and man, just didn't do a thing for me. But I'm not here to sell you on anything, <laughs> but uh, Aleve apparently does not have the heart disease problem. But well, let's see what this is going on to say. Explain the meaning of the p-value in this test. Would the result of the study normally be expected as statistically significant? Well, yeah, um, we do have uh, a number that is less than 5%. Let's take a look at the solution. Now, if the treatment had no effect, the probability of the difference in the results between the two drugs, the Vioxx patients and the uh, Aleve patients, would, would have occurred by chance alone. It exists. It's possible that the populations are the same. We don't need to get into heavy-duty statistical testing or anything like that. But for them to be the same would give you this probability, two tenths of a percent, or two times out of 10,000, one times out of 5,000, one time out of 5,000, would they be expected to match up on their own? But 4,999 times out of 5,000, they wouldn't. And I've seen rarer numbers for sure, but this is rare enough for sure. It's way rarer than the typical 5% that's given. And I might add somewhat arbitrarily, sometimes 0.01 is used, and even sometimes 0.10 is used, but not in our book. We're going to just keep it at 0.05. I just want to give you more perspective. If they have a little looser regimen, they'll go to 0.10. If they're a little bit tighter, they'll 0.01. Occasionally, they can even go tighter than that. And uh, But even so, this is a pretty, what I call tight number, 0.002. And 
yeah, that is statistically significant. It's probably as much less than the threshold, the accepted threshold, which is mostly used. And so it is statistically significant. In other words, something's happening here. <laughs> there, there's something that we can point at and say, yeah, we've got reason to believe that there is a difference between the two. And Aleev doesn't apparently have the heart disease, and Vioxx apparently does. And that was the problem. <laughs> yeah, they both work on arthritis, but what would you rather have? Something that doesn't give you heart disease on the, on the side? Well, you know, you hear of side effects, but that would be a pretty major side effect if you ask me. Okay, so let's continue and take a look at another slide. Switching topics, and we'll have more to say about p-values later. In, in statistics books, we have quite a bit more to say about it. We'll just give you a little bit more later on. We say that two numerical value variables are positively correlated if an increase in one of them accompanies an increase in the other. So one of them goes up, the other one goes up too. Or could happen that these two variables, such as x and y, I'll just put down x and y, which are typically used, and then we can fill in the blank with whatever we need to, to figure out. They might be negatively correlated if an increase in one of them, such as x, accompanies a decrease in the other. So the positive kind of looks like that, and the negative kind of looks like that. It's kind of like the slope of a line from beginning algebra. <laughs> it's really almost the same idea. But if neither one of these are true, the variables are called uncorrelated. So they used to call it white noise. It's really hard to find white noise. I've actually found it on my TV in one of the certain inputs. It just gives you kind of a staticky picture. <laughs> it's like all gray with spots on it. Uh, so uh, that's uncorrelated. There, you really cannot establish re any relationship between X and Y. It's just random. Okay, here's an example. Uh, determine whether the diameter, the diameter of a balloon and its volume are positively correlated, negatively correlated, or uncorrelated. Well, you look at the diameter of a balloon. So you blow it up partway and you put a little tape measure around it and you measure it's, what, five inches or something. And then you blow it up some more. Maybe it's seven inches or maybe it's eight inches. Um, depends on the size of the balloon, I suppose, until it pops or whatever. <laughs> But the thing is, the volume would go up too. So if you were to actually measure the air that's in the balloon, or maybe you fill it up with water, one could actually calculate, given certain tools, the, uh, the volume. I guess water would be a lot easier to calculate. But yeah, the diameter does increase in relation to the volume. There's a formula, what, four-thirds pi r cubed, something like that. You don't have to worry about that. But there is a direct increase there. And uh, you know we don't care about the actual numbers. But can you imagine blowing up the balloon, having the volume go down? What planet would that be on? <laughs> or having no relationship? That, that doesn't make sense either. Now, it may not go linearly. It may go up in an exponential way, but that does not concern us right now. Uh, it's increasing. And so we have positive correlation. And this is kind of an easy one to see, in my opinion. Blow up the balloon. Sure, the volume of the air is larger. What else could it be? So this is why they picked it, an example that you know, is intuitive, I think, for most people. Here's another one. Considering the vo consider the following data comparing, comparing by state the percentages of people who visited the dentist, which is something you should do. I do it actually three times a year in the past year. And then the percentages of people over 65 who have had all of their teeth extracted. Oh, that sounds awful. Ugh. And they picked six states, I guess, at random, not to pick on any particular state, but they picked them out. And so we take a look at the people who had dental visits. So, for example, in Oklahoma, in the past year, these people are over 65, not talking about younger people, only talking about older people. And so only 58% of them saw the dentist. That, that's a red flag right there. And, oh, wow, 28% of them had all their teeth taken out. What fun that must be. <laughs> Sorry, Oklahoma. Uh, let's take a look at another state, say Connecticut. Now here, it isn't 100%, should be, but 80% is quite a bit higher than the 58%, of course. And then less than half had all their teeth extracted. It's still what I consider an unacceptable number. Uh, but uh, I don't have my teeth extracted, but I go to the dentist a lot. So anyway, 12.8% uh, have all their teeth extracted, and that's still 
but it was half, less than half of what it was. So there seems to be kind of a correlation between going to the dentist more often and keeping your teeth. <laughs> well, you might lose one or something along the way because of various reasons, but to lose all your teeth, that, that just sounds horrible to me. And all the other numbers seem to be in between. And they're not perfectly lined up. This, this does seem to be increasing as we go from Oklahoma to Nevada, which is better, and then Alaska, almost the same. It goes up to Florida, goes up to New York, and then goes up to Connecticut. And Connecticut is quite a bit higher than New York. And then all the teeth extracted seems to be headed down, but not in a regular way. Uh, notice Alaska seems to be kind of an anomaly. Maybe they're just roughing it out there. Or maybe they're <laughs> their jerky's too hard up there or something. I don't know what's going on. But uh, yeah, it's not perfectly lined up, but this generally seems to be decreasing. And a picture is worth a thousand words, as they say. So let's take a look at the picture. Maybe we can zoom on this. I'm not sure. Yeah, we can. There we go. Okay, so uh, don't need all that text there. This is the picture, and these are in percentages. They, they didn't make that especially clear. They should, probably should have up a little key there. And they've listed the six states. So it would have been interesting to look at all 50 states. But I guess the problem with that is then you give the, the dot on Wyoming exactly the same weight as the dot on California, which, uh, well, it's just a slight difference in population size there. But even so, this is still something you could look at. And uh, clearly, you've got uh, Oklahoma. Poor Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, they had, you know, less than 60% dental visits in the past year. It was a majority, but not much more than that. And then they have almost 30% of their teeth extracted all the way down to Connecticut. I guess that's CT. And they're doing better. Most of them go to the dentist, 80%. And then quite a few of them, less, quite a few less of them have the teeth extracted, of course. Now, we even have a formula here that's beyond the scope of the class. Technology can give it to you. This is pretty much saying that if you have Y being all teeth extracted, which is kind of like the dependent variable based on your dental visits, X. So one kind of looks at this and says, well, the more times you go to the dentist, the less likely you will have your teeth to be extracted, which certainly seems to make sense, which is, by the way, kind of an obvious call. <laughs> and so one could say that the probability of having all teeth extracted, now let me just round these numbers heavily, minus point. 67x plus, I'll just call it 66. So it looks like 66 is a, kind of a standard number that it gets in there for the dental visits. And uh, so, oh, well, yeah, here's a negative number. That's why. So that, this is kind of an artificial number to bump it up. We don't need to go into the details, but the x is dropping for every percent that you put a, a dental visit in. We lose about two-thirds of a percent for the teeth to be extracted, 0.67 being two-thirds. So that's a good thing. <laughs> and it's a negative correlation, so I'll abbreviate this a little bit. In other words, it's headed downwards. And I always go with the X first. And as X moves to the left, Y is dropping. So more dental visits, less teeth being lost, and that's a good, good thing. So we can take a look and see what they said here. Uh, is the plot of the data along with the trend line. This is a trend line that we do not have to worry about. And uh, does this data show a correlation between people visiting the dentist and the elderly having all their teeth extracted? Yes, it does. And negative correlation is the deal. So, yeah. If it was positive correlation, <laughs> which it is not, then you would say the more times you go to the dentist, the more apt they are to get the pliers out and rip out all your teeth like they did on the Three Stooges ages ago. <laughs> or tie the uh, tooth to a, a string and tie it to a doorknob and then slam the door. <laughs> uh, I can't believe I watched that when I was a kid. <laughs> but anyway, uh, okay, so anyway, that's the idea of a negative correlation. And so they will explain that, of course, obviously. I've already said this. Uh, as the percent visiting the dentist increases, the percent of having all their teeth extracted decreases. And so these are correlated. You can see it, and the correlation is negative. Do not worry about the trend line that's beyond the scope of the class. Technology can get you that. But there are, there's a math way to do it. I used to teach that for a long time, but we're leaning on technology on my other classes on those. And yes, it is a linear correlation. I should say that sometimes you run into correlations that are like parabola. <laughs> That'd be a you know, quadratic 
correlation, which is beyond the scope of most any class until you get into advanced statistics. Yes, there are formulas for those things. Or cubics with a third power, for example, like the balloon might have been. But, uh, you know, those are not exactly elementary statistics. And we're not even doing the linear stuff. We're just taking a look only. This is an overview class. And so this would be a contradiction to that, more advanced. They do refer to this in the book, a quadratic correlation. So there's a correlation, but it doesn't line up. We're interested in straight lines. We want it to go up. We want it to go down. It may not be a perfect straight line, but it's close enough. Looking back at that picture, the lines were, the dots were not perfectly lined up. They are lined up well enough that we could faithfully put a line through it. A line of best fit is another way to call it. It best fits the points on your your graph, and it's the line that's closest, on average, to all of the points. And so then they can make projections for the other 44 states, which might be at least partly valid, assuming they pick those states randomly. Here's a little bit of the math here. The correlation coefficient, which is a measurement of how correlated it is, always lies between minus 1 and plus 1. And the closer it is to 1, the greater the degree of positive linear correlation. We'll show you some examples. One indicates perfect positive linear correlation. In other words, the points lie exactly on the line. And here's a picture right now. That's it. This is the one. I'll just put a one there. <laughs> it's lined up. There's just no deviation. They did not put the line itself. It's not hard to imagine a line going through these red dots. It's a strong, in fact, it's a perfect linear relationship. Strong is usually reserved for 0 0.9. <laughs> well, anyway, let's go back to the explanation. But the closer a correlation coefficient is to negative 1, which is still perfect, but it's the greater degree of negative linear correlation. So let's make sure we see that, positive versus negative. A negative 1 would indicate perfect negative linear correlation, kind of like the dentist example. And the points lie exactly on the line. Those are the easiest cases because your predictions are perfect. There's no doubt at all your prediction will be exactly the way you say it will be. But we predict this dot here. Maybe predict this dot here. Maybe even a dot back there. Since it's all lined up, and by the way, this just never happens in reality. So this is not something you'd ever expect to see. But predictions would be remarkably easy if this were the case. But, of course, the real world isn't really like that. Now, a correlation near zero indicates little, if any, linear correlation. Yeah, one could find the formulas, look at the uh, technology, and say, oh, there's a correlation coefficient of 0 0.02. <laughs> oh, it must be positive. Well, very slightly positive, but essentially it's white noise. And here it is, 0 0.02, speak of the devil. There it is. And we see dots. Which way is it going? At some point, oops, at some point it's not... Is that it's not realistic to put a line to it. A computer will do it for you, except when it's exactly zero. Then there's really nothing, not much you can do. I'll just give you some default situation, straight line. Uh, but this straight line here, yeah, one could try to fit it, but it basically is meaningless. There's a, there's a step or two missing in this, this talk here that uh, says that unless it's above a certain threshold, it's just not worth doing. So although technically you could do it, it's not meaningful. I had a supervisor at the Forest Service that would ask for that, even though it wasn't officially correlated. But he said, if, especially if it was close, he wanted a what-if situation, not for publication, but what would the line be? And he wanted to get some kind of prediction out of it, even though he knew it wasn't official, uh, even with a relaxed standard of like, you know, a 90% instead of a 95%. Um, he, would, he just wanted to see how it was going, and even if it wasn't quite there. And there would be a few times where it just barely missed the cutoff of the threshold. It's pretty strongly correlated, but not quite enough. Not quite enough. So there's always a line that can be found, but is it officially usable is another story. And we don't really get that deep into the material. But anyway, one could imagine a line. I'm not even sure where it would go. It would be headed generally upwards, but very weakly so <laughs> for a 0 0.02. In other words, it's just what I call white noise. If that means anything to anybody anymore, it's just dots on a screen that's basically randomized. And they do say, here's another one, the other example, minus 0.77. Okay, this one's definitely headed downwards. It's probably strong enough to have an actual line associated with it. We are not finding that. 
Um, but yeah, here's probably where the line would be fine. Um, yeah, so you'd have to check it out. I haven't actually done that because I don't have the data here. And uh, by the way, here, they're not saying what X and Y are. These are just sort of dots on the screen right now. They're not saying what X is, what Y is. But one could imagine uh, things like study time for your X. How many hours did you put in studying for the final? And then the grade on the final could be your Y. And uh, we like to think that the more hours you study, the better your grade would be. And I'm certain it would be correlated I don't know if it'd be a one, because there's a little bit of luck involved, and sometimes people are just naturally smart or naturally slow. And I was slow enough personally that I had to study a lot. And sometimes I still couldn't get the A in some of the more advanced classes I took. And um, so I can certainly sympathize. But anyway, the more hours you study, the more likely it is that you'll get a better grade. But there is not a guarantee. I can say the same thing about attendance. Generally speaking, the people that have perfect attendance get the better grades. What a surprise. <laughs> Not. <laughs> but there's no guarantee. I feel very sad for people who are there all the time and just barely get a D or something like that. Yeah, it, it, that can happen too. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, mostly though, mostly on average, <laughs> more often you come, more often you study, the, the better off your grade would be. And we're talking about percentage scores, by the way, like from 99 down to 30 or something like that. Not necessarily letter grades, which blur the distinctions a little bit because an A could be like 100% or it could be a 90%. And that's a big 10% difference or even more on curved situations. So anyway, that's the, the plan with that. Okay, so we we've taken a look at various values of the correlation coefficient, which, by the way, is called R, little r. <laughs> I don't think our book is even going there. Okay, so correlation coefficient, correlation coefficient whose magnitude is 0.8 or more indicates strong linear correlation. And by the way, the only correlation we're going to really talk about is linear correlation. So that's considered a little redundant in my opinion. So if you forget the word linear, don't sweat it. Don't sweat it. That's okay. Now, if a correlation coefficient is between 0.5 and 0.08, or I'm sorry, 0.8, the, the zero is distracting to me, um, we have a moderate linear correlation. So we can say that R is between 0.5 and 0.8. I'm not going to worry about the equal to signs. And a magnitude is less than 0.05 indicates weak at best, and very often no correlation. However, I will also say this, not to confuse anybody, if you have a big enough sample, like 200 or so, you can get an R of as low as like 0.2. I've even seen 0.19, and that could still be considered to be enough correlation to run with a line and, and say that, yeah, we're 90% sure this line will actually do the job. <laughs> so, by the way, this also flips around the other side. So, to be fair, I should, as the other book used to do, which we used to correlate with this, uh, the other versions, we could say that for strong, I'll just put it over here, that R could be less than minus 0.8, because that's on the other end of the scale, headed over towards that perfect minus 1. And one could also say that R is in between the 0.8 and the 0.5. So we could say that uh, R is, uh, you know, less than the minus 0.8, but greater than the minus 0.5. In other words, in between the two numbers on the negative side, and then to flip it around, R is actually uh, less than the uh, minus 0.5. Actually, I should, should say greater than, sorry, greater than. I knew that would confuse me. <laughs> so it's in between. So there's kind of, kind of a spectrum here where zero is right in the middle and one is on the side that's perfect. Minus one is also considered perfect negative. And so you've got the strong on, on the far corners Sorry about the scribbling. You've got the moderate in between. I'll just say moderate. And then weak. Weak or none in the middle. And I'll put some of the little mileposts here. Minus 0.8. Minus 0.5. So there we go. That's, that's kind of a spectrum. Sorry about my bad handwriting. Why do I get an angle with a dying pen? <laughs> okay, let's move on. An index fund is a type of mutual fund that invests in large number of diversified stocks. 
An index fund that invests in U.S. stocks is commonly considered to be a fairly safe investment. The U.S. stock market as a whole has been stable, despite a few ups and downs, but anybody would have them. And if U.S. stock prices fall overall, it's possible you might have been better off if you had also invested in a fund that is not strongly correlated with U.S. stocks. Diversification, in other words. Now, I'm, I don't invest in the stock market, but I have respect for people that do. Maybe someday I'll do that again. Uh, one calculation shows that the correlation coefficient between the prices of U.S. stocks and the Standard & Poor's 500 index and stocks in the London Stock Exchange, so U.S. versus London, which is called the FTSE 100, and the correlation is a pretty strong one, 0.8. That, that sounds strong. Not perfect, but strong. So does this correlation coefficient indicate that there's a great advantage in adding a London stock fund to your portfolio? Is this diverse, in other words? Diverse in a stocks and bonds type of sense, of course. <laughs> so anyway, correlation coefficient of 0 0.848 indicates a strong positive linear correlation. And that says that a London index funds price will rise and fall more or less in a similar way. It won't be exactly the same, but since they're correlated, if U.S. goes up, then London tends to go up too, and <laughs> vice versa. So there doesn't seem to be any great advantage in adding this investment. What you might want to do is go to a different country entirely that has a less of a correlation. But it might be still positive. It might be like a 0.5 or a 0.4. Instead, that's more of a moderate or weaker correlation. So you have a little bit more likelihood of diversity. So when U.S. goes up, let's just say example, R equals 0.4. And so here comes U.S. And uh, maybe U.S. goes down for a week, which has been known to happen. And maybe just to pick on a country, I'll just say Japan. Maybe Japan doesn't really have that thing going on, and they go up. <laughs> and that's good, because that recovers some of your losses. However, what's also likely to happen is that U.S. goes up, Japan may be going down, or maybe going much slower on the upward side. And I really don't know how their economy is doing. I think it's doing okay. But uh, anyway, that's how diversification might actually want you to head towards a lower number of correlation here. Uh, not a negative number, because that would say that what you have exactly the opposite would happen in the other one. Maybe you don't want that, but you don't want them tied together quite so tightly either. So if you're expecting the U.S. stock market to go down, you want something that goes in the opposite direction, I would just buy more of that other stock instead. <laughs> but since the U.S. market generally goes up, Maybe you'd want some other number, that some other place, Japan or Germany, that might go up maybe in a different arc, a different path, and maybe recover some of your losses. Anyway, it gets complicated, and that's something we don't need to worry about. So looking at this slide summary for Chapter 6, which we're not done with by any means. Our, our, our test isn't until uh, April 12 and 13. Wow, okay, so we have a ways to go on that one. Uh, but as we learned in 6.1, these are done by sections, data summary and presentation, boiling down the numbers, and four important measures in descriptive statistics, mean, median, mode, standard deviation. So yes, we spent some time on that. Mode is not as important as the others. Mean and median, very important. Standard deviation, yes, we will have you do an example of that, so you should remember how to do it. And then 6.2, the normal distribution, very important in statistics because so many distributions work out to be normal even when it didn't start that way. Why the bell curve? Well, we tried to explain on an overview basis what to do, and we'll get into the book a little bit more uh, about that coming up. So a plot of normally distributed data, the bell-shaped curve. Okay, the z-score for a data point, oh, so important, leading to a table leading to a percentile, I'll just abbreviate as percentile, which works out to be a probability, which tells you how rare it is or how common it is. And then that central limit theorem, I'm not going to have you define it or anything like that, but we'll just have you calculate the new standard deviation based on percentages. That's the only ones they did here. And uh, work with that a little bit for samples that come from a certain distribution. Well, we'll try to make that clear, and we'll do a, a big review before we're done. And coming up to the last part of it, the statistics of polling. I still have a lot more to say about that. 
Uh, can we believe the polls? Generally, yes, although not quite as well as they used to be <laughs> back in the good old days. <laughs> Polling involves a margin of error, a confidence level, usually 95%. That's the only one we really pay attention to here, which dominates the landscape anyway. And then the confidence interval, which is the plausible values that we think are are acceptable. Anything outside that confidence interval would be like a non-confidence non -confidence area that we're not very happy with. And we're going to say, nope, not good enough over there, but we'll take the ones in the middle. <laughs> and then the one we just basically talked about just now, effective drugs <laughs> for statistical inference and clinical trials. That was just one example, of course. Statistical significance and p-values. P-values were a level of rarity. And uh, when they're small, it's rare or statistically significant. So I'll abbreviate that. And when they're large, they're commonplace. And they're not very significant. Just nothing happening here. <laughs> and we have, of course, the correlation topic at the end. Very quickly, I might add. Positive, negative, uncorrelated, linear correlated. That's the only one we pay attention to. They briefly talk about the curved ones. We're not going to do any of those. They're just presented as a counterexample to show you how, how complicated it could be, potentially. Okay, I guess that'll about do it. Um, so this will be available hopefully later today, uh, over the weekend that is, and then scheduled to be watched on Monday or Tuesday. We're back live, of course, Wednesday, Thursday, depending on what section you're in. And uh, that will be on March 24, 25, as we get headed towards the break. I'll have more to say about Chapter 6. I haven't decided whether to do the quiz or just to go highlights of the book. I'll probably do highlights of the book instead. That, that seems to be the best way to go. Um, so we'll be uh, surveying that, not by slides, but basically by looking at the ebook and calling out certain important portions of it for you. Okay, that'll do it for, for now. And uh, study hard. I hope you did okay on the test. And remember, you can replace your score by the final score if you need. But, of course, I gave you, a, I thought, a generous curve for you. And uh, if you did well, congratulations. If not, better luck next time. <laughs> Study hard. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.